Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to the continuing story of Pensacola, Florida, North America's first place city. And in this series of episodes, we have been detailing the evolution of our city government, beginning, of course, with the arrival here in 1821 of Andrew Jackson, the establishment of the first city charter, uh, and then the evolution of aldermanic governor through times of railroad building, uh, the construction of our first or institution of our first bank, the problem of maritime hospitals, and then, of course, the war between the states. And in the last episode, we talked about the, the great things that began to happen to us beginning in 1870 with the coming of the new railroad, the uh, stepping up, of course, to the, uh, to the, the lumbering era, uh, the beginning of commercial fishing, and all of the wonderful things that suddenly made Pensacola flower. And that's the way things moved, of course, step by step into the middle of the 1880s. And by the time we reached 1885, uh, we had had a, water, a private water system installed. The city itself had created a sewage system. And the city fathers had granted a franchise for a street railway or, or, or street car system. Now, in the same basic period of time, the city had begun to, to move out in a, in a lateral way commercially. In 1873, uh, the first... Uh, private bank had been founded, the Bank of Pensacola, uh, led, led by uh, Francis Brett and William Knowles. Uh, seven years later, a second bank, the Fleurs National Bank, was opened by the, by the Sullivan Brothers. And the, the Sullivan Brothers, in turn, were the, were the ones who, just a few years later, uh, put, moved to, uh, to, to create a new headquarters for their bank. And as that, that, that uh, headquarters would be a corner of a huge new building at uh, Jefferson and Government, which would house the Pensacola Opera House, another great move forward. At about the same time, of course, we, we were installing uh, or seeing installed our first private telephone system. And just two years later, in 1887, the first electric generating plant and the, the generation and transmission of electric power came into being. But right at that same time, Florida went through a major change. Now, we must revert just a second to it really wasn't Pensacola's story directly, but right after the Civil War, uh, Florida went through a very traumatic time in trying to reestablish a new state constitution. They went through several writings of it. This was established in 1867 and moved forward. But there were a number of features of that constitution that many leaders of the state did not like. And so finally, with all of the, the problems of national uh, observance of this behind them, in 1885, the legislature legislators and others in Florida created a new constitution. Now, this is where Florida, where Pensacola's uh, life began to change because what was happened then, we changed the system, the, the, the charter for the city of Pensacola, and we became a, what they began called a provisional municipality. Now, instead of having a, an elected group of aldermen, now we were going to have city commissioners. And there would be a much smaller number than we had had under the, under the automatic system. And the city, these city commissioners would have far more power in their hands to literally run the departments of the city. Now, we'll take just a couple of examples of that. One of the men appointed in this role was named William Dudley Chipley. Chipley was the general manager locally here of the, first of all, the, the Pensacola and Louisville Railroad, which ran up to Flomaton. He also was the man who had engineered and built the Pensacola and Atlantic Railroad, which ran from Pensacola to the east all the way across with a junction with another railroad all the way east to Jacksonville. Chipley was Pensacola's first great booster. He believed in the, the future of this community, and he saw that city government was just not running well. And so he volunteered to become a city commissioner, and he did, and he was made the commissioner of public safety. Now, what he did, first of all, was, number one, he maintained the, the, the system of volunteer fire departments, but he now appointed a, a fire marshal. And this one man was to be in charge of training and coordinating all of the efforts of these scattered volunteer units, which made a great difference. And by the way, that particular system continued in effect here for more than 20 years. The second thing Chipley did was to totally reorganize the police department. Now, instead of being uh, w w uh, poorly paid, uh, kind of disorganized people, Chipley chose good men. He doubled the, the salaries that these men were paid. He put them in uniform for the first time. They now were equipped with, uh, with nightsticks or clubs. They were equipped with whistles and a, a whistle sis, uh, signal system for, for bringing people together if they were needed. And so under, the, under Chipley's guidance, 
guidance. This was done, and a single man, a man named Joseph Wilkins, now was named to be the city marshal and also the county marshal or sheriff, and Wilkins would serve in that, in that role for, for some years to come. Well, as, as we proceed through this next decade, Pensacola itself really begins to grow. All of the, 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 the presence of the railroads, the, the, uh, the uh, system of uh, c collecting and, and, and manufacturing lumber, all of this is developing beautifully. We are now beginning to see another change because from the beginning, to ship the lumber that was being cut here, uh, we had a, a great flow of small sailing vessels that uh, basically coming here from out of Scandinavia. These were the, the, the area of transport for bring, taking lumber from Pensacola to Europe. But by the time we get into the, into the late 1880s, we are now beginning to see more and more uh, vessels arriving here that are, are steam driven. They, they burn coal and are coming in here. And so as we move into the 1890s, we begin to see the whole waterfront begin to change. Uh, first of all, the, uh, we were now have the railroad, which has been built to the north, now has tapped into the center of Alabama, and it is possible to bring whole train loads of coal to Pensacola. That was, this was a, another major breakthrough us because now some of the businesses, the mills and so forth here, now we're in a position to, to uh, use steam equipment and greatly increase their, their own efficiency and productivity. Now, beyond that, of course, the city itself begins to see the whole waterfront change. Now we are obviously becoming an industrial waterfront. Now, as all of this begins and segues into the 1890s, Mr. Chipley and others have a dream. They believe that very shortly the United States is going to uh, take the lead in constructing a canal across Nicaragua, which would make a, an inter-ocean inter pa uh, passage possible. And this, of course, would just greatly increase the potential of the port here in Pensacola. So Mr. Chipley took the lead. And basically what he did was to engineer a, the desire on the part of his, uh, his, his parent railroad to begin to put facilities in place along the waterfront with, of course, with the city council's concurrence. And these facilities were leading up to what Mr. Chipley would be a great uh, industrial or commercial uh, sailing revolution. So in the course of the 1890s, we see Mr. Chipley uh, working again as a city commissioner, moving forward and doing these things. Number one, he got money from, uh, from the... Uh, uh, railroad officials in New York to build a whole series of new docks and warehouses at the foot of Commandencia and, and uh, Barrack Street on the waterfront. Secondly, uh, in that same period, Mr. Chipley was one of those who kind of engineered the coming here of a factory, a plant to produce commercial fertilizers. And when that, when that came on stream here in late 1889, the fertilizers that were produced here now made the, the, all of the soil in, uh, up in the area of uh, central and north uh, Escambia County suitable for raising cotton and tobacco. So within a matter of a few years, we are now uh, becoming a large agricultural center. And so to go with that, and along with other, uh, other root crops, Mr. Chipley uh, and the railroad built a huge a grain elevator right down on the waterfront to supplement Supplement the work, of the presence of the uh, of the the uh, docks and the warehouses. Now, of course, as all of this is going on, uh, two of the uh, two of the mills, uh, the the G George Washington Wright Mill and the Ricks Robinson Lumber Mill, which were right along the waterfront, one at Tenth Avenue and the other at Fourteenth Avenue, they ran their docks right out into the out into the water. So you can see the the city uh, the city fathers overseeing and supervising a whole change it's, that is taking place on, along the waterfront itself, and this this is becoming this is the driving engine for the local economy. Uh, as, as all of this has happened, we now. See See the beginning of another railroad beginning to its way uh, to make its way north, uh, hopefully going one day to Memphis and St. Louis. Uh, this became what originally called the Pensacola, Alabama, and Tennessee, and it has its docks down on the uh, on the waterfront at the foot of, uh, of Ruth Street. So all along the waterfront, you see the city council having its 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 role in big in helping to make the economy come into its own, and it, as it works, it does so. Now, of course, as all of this is as all of this is taking place, the, the the population is growing as well. And so the city council, again, is giving approval to the creation of three different uh, building and loan associations which make loans for the construction of new homes. Uh, they also are, are working uh, to promote the, the, the uh, further generation of electricity because by the, by the time we get into the 1890s, people realize that the era of electric power is coming. It's only a matter of how quickly you can get a first-class system in place before it will go to the, the full area. Well, 
We come to the, come to the year 1900, and the, the city council is concerned again about uh, uh, another change, which they, uh, they, they have, to have to make. When I said the 18, 1900, I, I'm sorry, I, it should be the year 1895, because by the time we reach 1895, uh, with all of these economic things going, there are lots of people in the business community that feel, well, things are going well, but they could be better. And so they're, they're beginning to say, well, we, <clears throat> we have a problem. These men, these city commissioners that we have, they are the, they're the department heads as well as holding the, the, uh, the policy role of the commission. These men are, are becoming too, too inclusive. We need to have a, a, a greater access here to the, to the council people. And so, again, uh, a, a group of community leaders went to the legislature, and once again, the city charter for Pensacola was changed. Remember, we started out with a charter with an automatic system. In 1885, we went to a city commission system. Now, in 1895, we are going back to the aldermanic system once more so we will have a, a 10 men chosen from various districts and they are the ones that are going to choose the mayor and proceed with the business of the city and that's basically the way things were as we we reached the year 1900 and now a new a new need is be is surfacing here by now uh, we have all by the census of 1900 the city of Pensacola has almost 20,000 people now one problem that we are beginning to see is that we do not have an adequate health care system. Now, in the 1890s, there have been several instances in which physicians, medical doctors, had, had pooled their own resources and opened what they called infirmaries. Now, these were, these were small hospitals with 10, 12, maybe 15 beds that had been located in old, uh, res what had been residences. These were mostly along uh, West Garden Street. And they were okay, but they, they certainly were not capable of putting in place the wonderful discoveries and radiology and laboratory work and some of the other things that were coming to the United States out of Europe. And so the, the, there was a need for a, a much, much better institution. And in the year 1900, uh, the city, again, with the county's concurrence as well, put together a, a charter for a, a, a license, rather, for a new hospital, which was, we call St. Anthony's. It would no longer be the infirmary, but rather St. Anthony's. And this was to be a 20-bed hospital, and it was in a building on the corner of Balin and Garden Street. This was a stock company, and uh, banker uh, Francis Brent was the chairman of the board. Uh, the two physicians were stockholders, Drs. Renshaw and Anderson, and also Miss Elizabeth Kroll, who had come here as the, a nurse and superintendent of uh, the hospital. She was a stockholder as well. And so in, in, in 1900, the, uh, the city council and the county commission uh, worked out a, a, an agreement with the hospital that to take care of medically indigent patients, the county would pay for uh, the use of three beds that would be uh, available to them at all times for anybody that came in that was medically indigent. And they would, they, in total, they, the two, two, uh, in, uh, two agencies of government would pay this, the hospital $375 per year. And so this was put in place. And we move into now into the early part of the, uh, the 20th century, and things are going along well. The, the hospital does well. It's a very nice hospital and well run. It, has its, it <clears throat> begins to put in place its own, uh, its own uh, nursing program. Healthcare seems to be under control. And of course, as all of this is happening, the, the role of finance is, is rising too because the city fathers are, are overseeing the, uh, and, and licensing additional uh, banks that are coming into place. We now see, we see the, the Citizens Bank, National Bank, as a part of the community. The Brent Bank and the First National Bank have merged. Everything is, is just looking so positive for the community. And so uh, <clears throat> we, we, we see more businesses of many different kinds uh, coming. Uh, in 1903, the Manhattan Hotel a very nice new hotel is built on West Garden Street. Everything is, is looking well. The, the cultural arts are prospering. The opera house is functioning well. Everything seems to be going just fine. There are even half a dozen new railroads that have been chartered here. They never got built, but they are under charter now, and people are planning to put them in place along the waterfront as well. Our industrial economic waterfront is just, semi, just blossoming beautifully. And so that's where things stood as we came to the year 1905, which we'll talk about next time.